Hi all, I am Dr. Sarnia Selvakumar. I am a pulmonologist and critical care specialist. I completed my MD pulmonology from Madras Medical College and subsequently went on to finish my IDCCM from Apollo Hospitals Chennai. So today I am going to in the next couple of hours we shall look at COPD, cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis. Some real life uh, scenarios, let us discuss the scenarios and the subsequent discussions. So, this is a 57 year old COPD systemic hypertension. He uses inhaled salbutamol and ipratropium, long acting theophylin he, and also lisinopril for his hypertension. He uses supplemental oxygen at night and during ambulation. Ciprofloxacin is prescribed for an exacerbation of COPD. Three days later, after having had nausea, he is brought to ER after uh, being found nearly unconscious. ECG shows normal sinus rhythm with non-specific STT changes. The drug likely to have caused this is salbutamol, theophylline, ipratropium, lisinopril or oxygen. Yeah, it is right, theophylline. Uh, basically with theophylline two things you have to remember, it is likely to cause arrhythmias and one more thing, it also lowers seizure threshold. So anyone who has a low threshold for seizures, when you use theophylline, you will have to use it with caution. And uh, quinolones, when you prescribe antibiotics, these quinolones can inhibit the hepatic metabolism and cause significant increase in serum theophylline levels. Uh, so, watch out for complications of theophylline, especially when we prescribe uh, respiratory quinolones for these patients. Okay, now, coming to treatment of COPD, as all of us know, short acting beta 2 agonist, uh, long acting beta 2 agonists. There are respiratory anticholinergics which are again short acting and uh, long acting. Then xanthine derivatives. Now the newer ones are phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors, inhaled corticosteroids and oral corticosteroids. When it comes to an exacerbation, whether short acting beta 2 agonists are superior over short acting muscarinic agents, we do not know. So, but generally we tend to use a short acting beta 2 agonists. Now, all our once daily long acting beta 2 agonists except formiterol, indicatorol, oladaterol and vilantrol. Uh, answers, okay, the answer is formiterol. Formiterol, the duration of action is 12 hours. So, we prescribe it as a BD dose. The rest indicatorol, oladaterol are all 24 hour action drugs. Now, coming to other drugs, roflumulast is the latest phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. But the catch here is, it is used for just two indications, severe, very severe COPD and chronic bronchitis. It is not generally used in mild COPD or moderate COPD. This mild, moderate, severe, very severe COPD classification is based on the gold uh, classification, which again is based on the spirometry values. And one more thing, all you have to know is inhaled corticosteroids are not to be used in isolation for COPD patients. Okay, a 67 year old man known COPD is evaluated because of 3 month history of progressive dyspnea. One year ago he had CABG for which he had a prolonged post operative stay. Uh, on physical examination he is found to have moderate V's. The flow volume loop is shown here. So, kindly look at the flow volume loop. Now, coming to the question, which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's worsening dyspnea? Is it an exacerbation of COPD? Is it congestive heart failure or a late sequelae of ARDS, tracheal stenosis or constrictive pericarditis? Have a look at his flow volume loop. Okay, answers? Tracheal stenosis, right. Now, Basically, the spirometry, the catch here is he had a prolonged post operative stay and the flow volume loop is boxed over here. It gives you a box appearance. So, flattening of the inspiratory and expiratory limb of flow volume loop indicates a fixed airway obstruction. Coming to spirometry, basically spirometry has an upward stroke and a downward stroke. The upward limb uh, represents the expiratory flow, whereas the lower limb